In the village of Badale, the people have been making pottery for thousands of years. Of all the stories how they became porters, my favorite one is about Ramo Gudude. She was one of the village's ancestors from the rare Dui, the people of the red sand. One day, as she was tending her animals, she found a handful of fine clay which she brought to her husband. He mixed it with water and threw it in the fire. The next morning, he found the clay had hardened. He realized they could make vessels with the clay. He told the clan elders about his experiment and they decided to sacrifice his wife to guarantee success in making pots. And they did so. From that time onwards, the best pottery in the country has been made in Burhebe. Somalia lies on the Horn of Africa, where the Red Sea and the Indian Ocean meet. The Burhebe region is in southern Somalia. Burs are granite hills that rise above the plains. Hebe is potter's sand. So Burhebe means hill of the potter's sand. The community is made up of nomads and villagers. The villagers are mostly farmers and the nomads are animal herders who settle in Burhebe during the dry season. They trade water and grazing rights for products like camel's milk and animal hides. Bardale is the largest village in the area with 400 people. Everyone does their trading here. Farmers and nomads trade their crops, milk and other animals in the square while the general stores carry imported goods. Their main crop is sorghum. Both men and women work in the field. Villagers live in huts which they built with sticks cemented with animal dung and sand from termite hills. Nomads live in animal skin huts because they are easier to pack up. The villagers' main occupation is farming, but they make extra money doing small jobs. One of these is pottery making. Of the 400 people in the village, only 20 are potters. All of them are men. Women do not pot because they never have. Tradition says that only men pot. Some of the potters work in their homes. Others, like Mohammed Isaac, pot in rock shelters that dot the base of Burhabi. Making pottery begins with mining the clay. This is a woman's job. They are usually members of the potter's family. To get the clay, you have to walk about half a mile west of the village to the clay pits. They are called dukes. No one person owns them. They are shared by everyone. Some women go to the dukes a few times a week, while others go every day except for Friday, which is a Muslim day of rest. It's common to see three or four women working in the dukes at any one time. Although they work independently, they find support in each other's company. When they have finished pounding and sifting the clay, the women have to get it back to the village. Sometimes they can get a camel 
or a donkey cart. Otherwise, they have to carry the clay on their backs. <laughs> when the men get the clay, they mix it with water and leftover slip. Slip is the clay that ends up at the bottom of the potter's water bowl after a day of rinsing hands and tools. They prepare fresh clay whenever they need it. In the busy season, this can be every few days. In the past, the potters made only three or four pots a day because the pots would be sold within the village or to people living nearby. They could not sell more because they could only travel by camel or on foot. So much has changed in the last 20 years. New roads and more trade. Today, 80% of the pots are sold to other regions of Somalia. So now, each porter makes up to 30 pots a day. Okay, Hussein Ibrahim is wedging his clay. He needs the clay like you need bread dough, pushing and rolling until he achieves the perfect texture. He says kneading is important to rid the clay of air bubbles because if air bubbles are trapped in the clay, the pot will explode when it is fired. When working with clay, the potter's main tools are his hands and feet. He uses his toes to turn a wooden plate that rests on a pivot. Ina Ibrahim Abdi is starting a water pot. It is round bottomed, like most of the pots he makes. So he starts on the walls and will put the bottom on last. For flat bottom pots, it is easier to put the bottoms on at the start. Then the walls are formed with coils. The potters can make the walls thick or thin. They make the thinnest walls for the cooking pots. Because the thinner the wall, the hotter the pot can get without cracking. This pot is called idin. It is used to transport fire and to burn incense. Incense is very important to Somali men and women, but only women burn the incense. They use it to perfume their hair, their clothing, and their homes. It scents the air and sweetens their lives. Incense is so popular throughout the country that the Somali poet Galal wrote a poem about it to his new bride. He says, I am a man who appreciates sweet-smelling things, so do not shrink from the use of incense. As long as you remain with me, never cease to use the incense burner. Ina is adding a rim to the water pot. He makes the rim thicker than the rest of the pot, so it will be stronger. 
because it is easy to bump the top when getting water. When the reams are finished, the pots are smooth and pounded. The potters use a wooden strip to smooth the outside and a seashell to smooth the inside. After smoothing, the larger pots are pounded with a wooden paddle. The steps of smoothing and paddling allow the potter to turn a roughly formed pot into a refined piece of craftsmanship. Paddling removes hidden air pockets and compresses the clay, making it denser and stronger. Smoothing gives form to the pots. Inna is shaping this cooking pot. It grows rounder as it pushes the walls out with a seashell. This is a traditional Somali headrest, but the potters use it as a knee rest when they work the clay. When the pots have been smoothed and paddled, they are left to dry until leather hard. Then they are decorated. Each decoration has a name. The three diagonals carved from right to left are called halbet. Those carved from left to right are called jeef. If you ask, what do the decorations mean? The best answer is, they mean burhebe. In most cases, you cannot look at the individual markings like halbet or jeef and find a message. Most of them do not mean anything by themselves. You must look at the completed pattern to find a meaning. The decorations tell you two things, what kind of pot it is and where it was made. When a Somali looks at one of these pots, they will know it is from Burhebe because of the design, since each region has its own decorations. The pattern will also tell them what type of pot it is, what it is used for. Here is one of the few times that markings do have meanings of their own. The marks that look like the letter H are Burhabe tribal symbols. Finish. You are probably wondering about the round bottomed pots. Why are they round, you ask? They do present some problems, but so many benefits as well. The most obvious problem is they cannot stand upright on their own, but that is easily fixed. The villagers keep the water pots in their kitchens and sit them on stands or in a hole in the floor. The cooking pots are not a problem either. The villagers do not have flat stoves in their kitchens. They either use three rocks on the floor or a three-pronged brazier. The pots fit on the rocks and braziers, so they never spill. In fact, the rounded bottoms are quite popular with Somalis. They provide many advantages. When using the cooking pots, the round bottom allows the heat to pass evenly from the bottom to the top. This helps protect the pot from cracking every time a meal is prepared. Cooking pots are more popular today than ever. 
Some other clay pots are being replaced by metal, like the teapot, because the metal one is more efficient and easier to handle. But cooking pots are still highly regarded because many Somalis like the taste of food cooked in clay. Clay pots are five times cheaper to buy than metal pots. They make the food taste better and are economical too. As with the earlier steps in the process, great care is taken in finishing off the pots. They are not put aside until they look as perfect as if they had been thrown on a wheel. As a last step, handles are added to the pots that need them, like this brazier. Then the pots are put out to dry. They have to dry for at least two days before they can be fired. But the potters usually wait until they have at least 50 pieces. When they are busy, this is about twice a week. The fires are built on the outskirts of the town where the smoke and the mess do not get in anyone's way. Inna's wife Hawa had just brought him burning coals in a fire pot. Sometimes the potter's wife will either help with the firing or do the entire process for their husbands. Other times he will fire alone as Ina is doing since his wife must tend to their baby. Ina starts by giving the largest pots a good smoking to make sure they are completely dry before beginning the actual firing. You saw how much skill is needed in making the pots. Well, firing is even more of a challenge to be mastered. An unskilled firer can ruin an entire batch of pots if he misjudges the weather, stacks the pots poorly, or miscalculates the rate of burning. Kiln firing can last anywhere from several hours to a week, but open air firing like this takes only about an hour. The possibility of error is much greater, so precision and skill are crucial. Since the key to a successful firing relies on uniform heat, Ina places metal sheets on the windy side of the fire to even out the rate of burning. The villagers like to watch the firing. The children especially enjoy the sight. I have heard that some cultures have superstitions against viewing a firing, but in Bardale everyone is welcome to watch, as long as they stay a safe distance away from the flames. Ina knows the pots are finished because of their color. Before they are heated, the pots are dark brown. When the maximum temperature is reached, they turn red and are ready to be removed. This young woman, Zuleha, is picking up her order for two water pots. The pots are of great importance to the community. 
After the men make them, the women put them to use. The various pots play an integral part in their daily lives. The women are responsible for preparing meals and gathering water. In fact, they do not allow men into their kitchens. The staple meal is sorghum and camel's milk. Sorghum is a grain that tastes like oatmeal. After being harvested, the sorghum must be pounded, then hurled, as Zuleha is doing, then ground and sifted. It is then mixed with water and cooked over an open fire. But first water must be gathered at the pond and carried back a half mile to the village. This is not easy work. The pots hold anywhere from 12 to 21 liters of water. Zuleha is grinding sorghum. She might cook it in a Wawai Bashal pot. Bashal implies a group of friends who come together for fun and the pot is seen as another friend. Friendship is an important part of the women's daily lives. They enjoy doing chores together like going for water. This is what they teach their daughters, to take care of themselves and to help each other. They teach them to run the household and to cook. They help them to grow up to become strong women who take pride in their work and life. The village women share similar roles with the nomadic women who travel through the area. Though they carry few possessions, the nomad women cannot do without their cooking pots. The three pots on the right are called braziers. They are used to cook with. Coals are burnt inside and the pot sits on top of the handles. Accidents do happen and eventually the pots crack or break. They are repaired and reused when possible. When the pots become useless, they are thrown out. Some of the pieces get buried over time and will probably be dug up again in thousands of years by students of history. But for now, when the pots break, the potters make more and they teach their children to make more too, so they'll always have pots to use. Ina is helping Abdullahi Masood learn to use his toes. It is a difficult task to master, but Abdullahi is a sharp boy, a fast learner. Soon he'll be as good as Ina, maybe better. And then Abdullahi will become one of the master porters of Burhebe, and he will pass the tradition on to his own children. Milk girl 